This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. We have the special honor today of having Mr. Max McLean in the studio. Max, if you bear with me for just a second, I want to read directly from your bio because I don't want to miss any of these incredible accolades. Max is an award-winning actor and founder and artistic director of New York-based Fellowship for Performing Arts. Max adapted for the stage the screw Screw Tape Letters, C.S. Lewis on stage, The Most Reluctant Convert, The Great Divorce, Genesis, and Mark's Gospel. His recent writing and producing credits include Martin Luther on Trial. As an actor, he created the roles of Screwtape in New York on national tour and in London. C.S. Lewis in The Most Reluctant Convert on national tour and in an extended 15-week run in New York. Mark in Mark's Gospel and Storyteller in Genesis. Mm. Max received the Jeff Award, Chicago Theater's highest honor for his performance in Mark's Gospel. He has been nominated for four awards from the Audio Publishers Association for his narration of the Listener's Bible. His creative work has been cited with distinction by the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, Wall Street Journal, and CNN, to name just a few media outlets. So, Max, welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Thank you, Trey. I hope I didn't embarrass you with that introduction. It's quite impressive. No, I enjoyed it. Oh, okay, good, (laughs) good. So you are currently in Austin for C.S. Lewis, The Most Reluctant Convert, Mm -hmm. which, by the way, I'm sure you know, is sold out. So congratulations on that. Right. Um, And and you are no stranger to Austin. You actually went to the University of Texas. I did. In fact, I started my theatrical career here. That's what I thought. So in, in... I first discovered you when you brought the screw tape letters to Austin. I think I caught it in maybe 2013. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when you came back a few years later, you and I actually had had lunch, and I had the privilege of chatting with you and, and have been trying to figure out a way to get you back to town ever since. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here with this particular show, and, and I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, this so. is a dream come true to come back to UT. Uh, I started my th- theatrical uh, interest here. Uh, I went to the, uh, I was a history major. I thought I was going to go to law school, uh, but in my junior year, I had an experience that that revealed my sociophobia, the fear of being in front of people. Right. So I uh, decided to go to the weird part of campus <laughs> and take an oral interpretation class. Mm. And that's when the theater bug bit. Okay. Okay. Well, I, those same skills probably would have served you well as a lawyer as well. I guess. <laughs> I, I suppose. Uh, but uh, no, I really, I, I really feel called to this, and uh, and particularly, uh, I mean, I'm sure you'll get to this. Uh, most of our work is uh, religious based, right? Uh, and uh, the desire to uh, integrate my faith with my art. Uh, really led to this very unique uh, opportunity. Sure, sure. Well, let's back up just a little bit. Sure. I noticed you were born in Panama City, mm-hmm. Panama, mm-hmm. Um, and then came to the U.S. at age four. That's right. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, and you said through New York City by the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, we came on a, on a, on a boat in uh, 1957, and uh, yeah. So uh, my my mom uh, m- uh, married a, an American soldier, okay, uh, who brought us to the United States. He was from Brooklyn, New York, brought us home, and uh, uh, so I, I became a naturalized American citizen shortly thereafter. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. How was it growing up in New York City? Well, I, I actually didn't grow up in New York City. Uh, Dad was born there and raised there, but he was a, a military person. He and so he uh, he he went back uh, he he went back just shortly, and then he was uh, stationed in in uh, all over the country and 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 came to Texas quite regularly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, stationed so, Fort Bliss mostly. So that's how you got connected with the University of Texas, I assume. Uh, that's right, because okay. in in those days, uh, if you uh, if you were in the military, you got in-state rates, mm-hmm. and in those days, the in-state rate at University of Texas at Austin was four dollars a credit hour. I could afford that. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> it's not that way anymore. I assure you. 
So while you were at the University of Texas, you, you decided to try to overcome your fear of, of public speaking uh-huh. by, well, tackling it head on, so to uh, speak. Yes, it was, it was a challenge. You know, I, I really, uh, and, I'm, and I wasn't really in the, in the habit of tackling things head on, mm-hmm. but I really felt compelled that, boy, this is a problem, you right. know, because sociophobia is when, when attention is placed on you. Mm-hmm. You know, you you turn red. You turn, it's it's a it's an involuntary response, right? And so you you really have to, to deal with it. You sure. know, it's your your heart starts beating. Uh, so anyway, uh, what what it did though, it it unlocked this desire to work with language, okay, uh, and great uh, literature. So that's uh, that's where I spent a lot of my time. And so after the University of Texas, you went and studied more in London. I did drama school in London, then I went to New York and, you know, ba- began my career in New York. So at point, some point you decided you wanted to integrate what you were doing with your faith. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, how did you come to your faith? Yes, well, uh, I w- I'm an adult convert. Uh, when I graduated university, I was not a Christian. Um, but uh, it was shortly thereafter I met a woman my, who later became my wife. She was a Christian. And uh, through a series of, of uh, you know, weeks and maybe even months, uh, we, uh, we were dating and she introduced me to a lot of her Christian friends. And I remember one conversation I had that uh, I, I graduated from UT with a history degree, even though my minor was theater. Uh, and this person just made this comment uh, that, uh, you know, Jesus was a person in history just like Lincoln, just like George Washington. Mm-hmm. Well, it, amazing t- enough, that was news to me. Right. Because I thought Jesus was fairy tales. Sure. I really, you know, it was in a part of my, put in a part of my mind that wasn't dealing with the real world. Right. And so when that, lo- what that little comment did is it moved it from that little place of way, way in the back of the mind, more to the front of the mind. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Lord just used that to uh, take him more seriously and within days, probably within weeks, uh, I made a commitment to Christ. That's incredible. But I was already an actor. Sure. So, uh, so what happened was, uh, you know, I didn't get the, I, I, I started uh, uh, becoming much more involved in Christianity and the church. And, but because I, I wasn't raised in the evangelical community, I didn't get the memo that Christians weren't supposed to be actors. <laughs> so, but uh, you know, I was. I'm glad all... you didn't get the memo. <laughs> by the way. So anyway, what 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 happened was is that uh, I, I was I knew the gospel was the greatest story ever told, and I knew the theater was the most powerful medium to tell stories. Mm-hmm. So uh, an idea quickly came, and and I was in London at the time, and I was seeing the f- most amazing theater in the world, and so I thought, why don't is there a way to combine the two? Right. So that's what happened. And so at that point, you decided to take different books of the Bible and make one man plays out of it. Well, not right away, uh, because I, I didn't know how this was going to work. Okay. But uh, I, uh, I got involved in, in, in our church uh, in, in New Jersey at the time. We came back to New York, and, and my wife and I were living in New Jersey, right across the river. And uh, uh, I... Uh, I decided to go to seminary mm. uh, because I was really engaged in what I was learning. Uh, I didn't finish seminary. A little seminary goes a long way. Uh, <laughs> but while I was there, I met some very interesting people. Ravi Zacharias was one. Uh, and then uh, over the course of the, you know, the, that, that pathway that I took uh, led me to meet other people like Chuck Colson, R.C. Sproul. Right. And each of these men... Uh, encouraged me to pursue uh, drama, theater as ministry. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't know what that looked like. Right. But, uh, but the first thing that happened was, why not use the skills and techniques I developed in the theater and apply it to presenting the Bible? Sure. So uh, I did uh, one-person shows of Mark, of Genesis, of Acts. Then I recorded the Bible. I've oh, wow. recorded the Bible five different times. And, and through the, you know, the... the, the uh, the miracle of, of technology, um, people all over the world know my voice. Sure. And in fact, sure. uh, someone told me that in, in China, my, my latest translation is used to uh, uh, teach English. 
Oh, wow. So if you hear Chinese people with deep, resonant voices <laughs> articulating every word, you'll right. know why. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. That's incredible. Now, is that a difficult process to, to record the Bible? Uh, not for me. Okay. I mean, you know, it, I, it's, I think the first couple of recordings I did, uh, I thought they were too actorly. They were too overdone. Okay. You know, uh, and what it did, they were great for the stage because stage you have to overcome space. But, but in... Uh, when you're doing an audio, it's kind of one on one, so it's like this. Right. So you have to you have to bring it down. But but the but the thing that theater brings to it is is it adds a level of intentionality. Why are they speaking? What's the motivation for speaking? And and then you can you know adjust the voice a little bit to uh, distinct make the characters distinct. Right. So all of that uh, really. Uh, I enjoy doing. So if somebody wanted to find these audio recordings now, where could they find them? Oh, Amazon, anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, they're HarperCollins publishes them. Okay. Yeah. Incredible. Mm-hmm. So in 1992, you founded the Fellowship for Performing Arts. What was the impetus for that? Well, uh, I, when I started doing these uh, one-person shows of Mark and Genesis and those kinds of things, I was mostly doing them at churches. And then I decided that I wanted to uh, reach out to colleges and universities. So I would contact uh, some campus ministers. Mm -hmm. And one of the campus ministers I I reached out to was Will Willimon at Duke University. He's very well known. Uh, I don't know if he's there now. I I think he might be retired. But he was uh, the the lead chaplain at Duke University and, 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 you know, ran Duke's Cathedral, which is almost, you know, it's an amazing cathedral. Right. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, at that performance, uh, the, the audience was much more diverse than a church audience. In fact, one of the people there was the head of the drama department. And uh, he wrote me a letter after that performance of Mark's Gospel. And he said that, you know, I was invited to your show. I was looking forward to it with all the anticipation of dental surgery. <laughs> and... <laughs> And, mm. uh, and yet he said, what did I see? I saw the most, uh, some of the most powerful literature I've ever known. I, I realized for the first time why this is such compelling material, right? You know, whether you're a believer or not. And so that got me to thinking. I says, huh. You know, so uh, at that time, I, I didn't have a nonprofit behind me. So I thought if, if I could organize, uh, I could do uh, bigger better productions, you know, more, because, uh, you know, the inter- in- entertainment space is so competitive and, right. and, and the expectation level is so high that if you don't reach it, you're immediately dismissed. Mm-hmm. So you really had to raise, uh, raise the bar. Okay. And so uh, that's why I started Fellowship for Performing Arts, so that I could uh, go on salary uh, and be much more strategic in my thinking about how and where and how, uh, we do these things. Right, right. So, you know, for most people, the Bible is a um, unapproachable um, tomb, yeah. right? Uh, 66 books uh, and, and can oftentimes be hard for people to consume. So the fact that you have broken it down into different books of the Bible uh, has to reach a whole lot more people than, than we might otherwise reach. Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's, there's something very compelling and off-putting, both, right. about the Bible. Right. Uh, you know, there's got to be something to it, and yet it, it, it feels like, you know, how do I get around it? How do I get through it? How, 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 do I, how does it speak to me? So uh, I do think that uh, adding, the, adding the layer of storytelling because it, they are basically it, uh, a large part of it is story, and, right. and actually those are the most compelling. And, right. and and the thing about story is, is it 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 touches the imagination. And and one of the theses that we do in the theater is if it doesn't capture the imagination, it doesn't really matter what else it does, because people are not going to uh, put forth the the uh, the logical effort to you know to really. Uh, take it apart because it, it first of all you you got to have this wow thing that's going to drive you to let me get in there let me sure. really figure it out sure. you know uh, so and and of course that second level is what 
uh, I think causes people to to reevaluate and examine their lives. Sure, absolutely. So you decided to take Screw Tape Letters, which was a book written by C.S. Lewis, which most people probably know C.S. Lewis because he's the author of The Chronicles of Narnia. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he is an amazing figure, probably the most influential Christian writer of the 20th century. So what what led you to want to convert Screw Tape Letters into a play? Well, we were pretty uh, pretty focused on doing these Bible presentations till uh, early 2000s when this theater professor at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey <clears throat> saw our production of Genesis, really liked it, wrote me a, an email and suggested that I would make a really good screw tape. <laughs> and I didn't yeah, know if that, that a flattering yeah, comment? Yeah, I, I don't know if that was a comment, a, a compliment <laughs> or not. But I was intrigued, so I, I we, uh, we decided to have a, a conversation about it and he had an idea how to do it. And I said, well... If we can get the rights from C.S. Lewis estate, we'll have a go of it. Mm-hmm. And it took a while to do that because they're right. pretty precious with the, with the rights. But sure. but uh, over time, they gave us the rights, and uh, and then since then, have given us the rights to all all the right. uh, subsequent pieces. Uh, and and I was I'm still shocked at at how uh, how people. I think the idea of spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lewis r- really wanted people to understand that, uh, what does he say about, uh, uh, we must not be ignorant of his devices. Right. Uh, he, uh, he, he masquerades as an angel of light. Right. Uh, but, you know, he's a roaring lion seeking who he will devour, and therefore you have to guard your heart. So these things sort of uh, uh, just play in people's imagination. Uh, it's still the most popular piece we do. We right. we've, we actually have a tour of it. It's playing right now. It's sold out in Washington D.C. for eight performances at the Shakespeare Theater. Oh wow! Right now. So for yeah. our listeners not familiar with Screw Tape Letters, give us the basic premise of the book. Yeah. Well, what Lewis did is he created this morally inverted universe where up is down, good is bad. God is called the enemy, and Satan is called our father below. And and Screw Tape is this uh, kind of senior demon who's instructing a junior demon. On the art of 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 bringing an unsuspecting human on earth uh, towards damnation, right? You know, it's uh, either uh, screw tape says either uh, either moving the moving the patient to the enemy, and the enemy in this case is God, mm-hmm. or to us, uh, and that's the, it's this uh, battle line that's that's uh, uh, that is our everyday life. Sure. Absolutely. Well, and, and I recall from from watching the production uh, how compelling it was because at some point or another, given the issue and how the demon, how Screw Tape and the Junior Demon react, mm-hmm. you notice that moment where you're like, "I have been in that moment," right? Well, yeah. And one of the reasons for that is Lewis was actually uh, using his own experience, so it's mm-hmm. it's it's, a, it's it's his own testimony. Uh, his own almost confession of his his battles with temptation. Right, right. So, what was next? What what, what did you decide to do after? Well, Screw Tape? we we had, with when when we had such uh, a a success with Screw Tape, you know, we we knew that there was this this legion of people that were uh, engaged by C.S. Lewis. Mm-hmm. So then, uh, what Lewis did. After Screw Tape, he wrote *The Great Divorce*, and and *The Great Divorce* is is essentially the other side of the Screw Tape story, okay. where how the spirit world, the angelic world, interacts with our as humans is always compelling us to press on toward the goal to win the prize to which God right. has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Right. You know, it's it's pushing you to go beyond where you want to go, and and what Lewis was examining there was our resistance to that. Mm. Uh, our daily resistance to mm-hmm. that, because uh, you know, conversion means c- counting the cost. Right. And uh, and so the great divorce is a is a a, a fantastical uh, narrative story about these people in the gray town, which is Lewis's metaphor for hell, being invited to take a day trip to heaven, mm-hmm. but their souls are so uh, singed, I suppose. They're 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 so corrupted in the sense of 
uh, th there's never anything. Nobody, nobody ever has good intentions. There's, right. you know, there's what, what's what's in it for you. You know, what's the real motive? Sure. You know that sort of thing. There's there's this element of of skepticism, cynicism actually. That's right. Uh, so that they, you know, they don't. They actually are invited to heaven and they don't like it. That's <laughs> you know they don't like it. And right. and and Lewis's basic premise is, is that uh, uh, those who are in hell choose it. Uh, mm -hmm. The doors of hell are locked from the inside, right? Uh, and uh, and he says that you know people in hell would rather, as as John Milton says, uh, rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's and 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 that's really the the biggest challenge in human life is our pride, right. uh, our will, our unwillingness to submit to God. Right. Well, ultimately, God gave us free will, yeah. and, and He's going to chase after us. Yeah. Uh, but at some point, it's our choice. At the end yeah. of the day, right? Yeah, it, because it's uh, it, it says uh, freedom, the 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 gift by which we most resemble our Maker, and uh, that's a marvelous line uh, that really does that that God will not, uh, you know, He He will not violate that. Right, yeah. right. So talk to me about Martin Luther on trial. Uh, Martin Luther is an incredible figure in Christian history. So what, what uh, led well, you to do that? Well, I, I've always been intrigued by Martin Luther, mm -hmm. uh, his story. And so uh, in 2012, 2011-12, we were actually thinking about 2017 because that would be the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation when Luther... Uh, uh, nailed the, the 95 Theses to the, the Church of Wittenberg in, right. in October 1517. And so we, we wanted to have something to, to offer for that. And so we commissioned Chris Craig and Day to write a, a draft, sent her to Germany, do the research. She did amazing research. And uh, then we did the play in New York and D.C. and, and then toured it extensively. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a highly entertaining because Martin Luther is, is a is a personality, huge Shakespearean personality, right. that uh, uh, had a lot of warts, a lot of warts, and we do not shy away from them. Good. And so what we do, we put them on trial. We we uh, we we take a 500 year perspective. We didn't want to do a period play back in 15, even though we have scenes in the 1517. Okay. But we put them on trial, where we bring uh, witnesses for and against Luther, uh, and some of the witnesses are uh, Hitler, Freud, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who's oh, named, wow. named yeah. after him. Uh, Sigmund, uh, you know, we talk, mentioned uh, Freud, and we actually have the audacity to to bring uh, the current Pope Francis on stage. Oh, interesting! Yeah, interesting. And, uh, and that scene is is fantastic. Mm. And of course, the devil is the prosecutor. Saint Peter sits on the bench. Katie von Bora, his wife, is for the defense. And we have this uh, really interesting trial. Mm -hmm. Super, well, super interesting. Well, I've, I've really wanted to see that one since I, I saw it coming out. And, and I'm going to have to uh, book some airline tickets and go see it next time I can. Well, what we want to do is right now we, we, just had, we just finished our last tour of it. So it's, in, it's, it's uh, asleep for the moment, but we anticipate bringing it back in maybe 20, uh, 2020, 2021. Well, then after the show, I will try, you to, try to convince you to bring it to Austin. Good. Okay. Good. Love to do it. So the show tonight that I'm very much looking forward to seeing, tell me what you were looking to achieve. Yeah. Well, the, uh, what's interesting about uh, C.S. Lewis, The Most Reluctant Convert, uh, is Lewis writes about his conversion constantly. He mm -hmm. writes about it in screw tape letters because he's the patient, the object of, of screw tape's attacks. Uh, he is the narrator in The Great Divorce who is trying to count the cost. So in both of these things are the things he struggled with in terms of, of, of dealing with his own conversion. And then he, he wrote a biography about his conversion, Surprised by Joy. He wrote an earlier biography. His, the first book he wrote after his conversion was a book about his conversion right. uh, called Pilgrim's Regress. Uh, even one of his later books, uh, Till We Have Faces, has elements of his conversion story. So that's the central story of his life, mm -hmm. his conversion from atheism to Christianity. And it was a long story, and it's filled with a lot of suffering. Uh, he lost his mother when when she was when he was like eight or nine. Uh, he had a horrible relation with his dad. Mm -hmm. um, he had uh, this horrific uh, uh, 
experience in World War One, where he was in the trenches. Right. And so, you know, he came to the conclusion that that either there is no God, uh, or uh, there, uh, or that God is indifferent to good and evil, or worse, he's if he does exist, he's an evil God. Mm. And so that's where he lived. Uh, right. And 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 that and he said somewhere a very interesting line. He says, I, uh, "No, I did not believe in God, but I was uh, I did not believe God existed." But I was angry at God for not existing. So I mean, <laughs> yeah. th- that's kind that of the makes, contradiction makes that that he that he had. Uh, but then his conversion uh, is a slow process. Uh, took over many many years due to relationships, but also is a very it was relational in the sense that uh, it was first intellectual, it was re- and relational, and then it became emotional, uh, and. The relational part were some of the the, the most the biggest influences in, in his life in terms of his, the books he read, the people he t- talked with, uh, people like J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, Owen Barfield, the books he read, uh, um, George MacDonald, G.K. Chesterton. Mm. These all had a real impact on him. And I remember, and one of the the he, one of the key factors is that if reason is only uh, the accidental result of atoms colliding in skulls, you know, it doesn't seem very reasonable to 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 posit that one accident can give an explanation for all other accidents. Right. So that was like a, a stumbling block for him because he really valued reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, he really valued the fact that you know uh, that logic and reason brings forth indisputable truth so that right. that and that you you decide things by inference right. by deduction so is that just atoms colliding in skulls is your most what does he say is my most profound thought merely uh, 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 you know atoms colliding in skulls a product of heredity and just and, accident. And physics right right and and, and then uh, so he said boy that that was a stumbling block. So then he he had to posit as a result of that that the the most reasonable explanation is that some kind of God exists, some kind of mind exists. So he he, he parked there, but he's not somebody that just leaves it there, right? Mm. You know, that's right. You know, he, he he's says, a deep thinker. Yeah, he says, okay, what does that mean? Right. And 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 he and he said that you know my. My biggest argument against God was the universe was so cruel and unjust. And then he asked, "Well, how did I get this notion of cruelty and unjust? Right. You know, uh, uh, I call a line crooked because I have some idea of a straight line. That's right. So, uh, uh, what am I basing my comment that the universe is cruel and unjust? What am I comparing it to? Right. So these are the things that led him closer and closer to God. And then, uh, then he became a theist. Uh, which to him meant that that the moral law was pressing hard on him and that he realized that he he had to abide by the moral law. Mm-hmm. But he had no place to understand Christ, and that came later, th- particularly through a conversation with J.R.R. Tolkien. Right, right. And, and that's a relationship. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, most people don't understand the relationship uh, between C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, uh, Tolkien, Tolkien. However. Well, Tolkien is how the Brits pronounce. I, I used to pronounce Tolkien, but Tolkien. But now, because uh, it's actually they say Tolkien, okay. Tolkien. So the author it, uh, of the Lord of the Rings, right. and, and you know, Tolkien credits C.S. Lewis for him ever publishing Lord of the Rings. That's right. Interestingly, so it, it's uh, when I found out about that relationship, I, it was very fascinating to me. So my favorite C.S. Lewis book is Mere Christianity. Um, and that helped me grow in my own faith. Do you feel like that's an approachable book for for the newer generations, for millennials of today? Uh, it is for me. Yeah. Um, the I mean, it, it, Lewis is not an easy read. So uh, I, and 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 yet, um, and and I don't think you 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 know, in order to become a Christian, you have to be a PhD or anything like that. That's you right. know, that, I don't think that. But but I do think that if you if you want to for a certain class of people, I mean, Lewis was was a, an intellectual writing for intellectuals, right? You know, he right. was a, he was an academic, probably the the, the most popular uh, uh, academic at Oxford and Cambridge in his day. Mm-hmm. You know, his lecture hall were, were filled, and he was very respected, uh, uh, you know, across the board. 
Uh, but he also wrote, wrote Narnia primarily because he wanted to uh, narrate these stories in a way. And he, he, he said in order to write for children, he didn't want to dumb it down, but he did want to limit his vocabulary. Right. Uh, right. In order to get these concepts and, and these visual concepts, you know, the, the Aslan, the Great Lion, uh, those are, those, they have a clarity to them. Mm-hmm. That uh, really that helps. is much more approachable. Yeah, sure, it is much more approachable. But I I I, I truly appreciate uh, what he did in Mayor Christianity. And one of the reasons it's such an important book is his ability to to illustrate his points are so clever, correct, and so uh, so uh, imaginative. You know, they mm-hmm. really do capture the imagination. That's right. Uh, he does that. Uh, in fact, there was an article, I think, in Christianity Today, you know, comparing uh, three or four of the most popular apologetic books with mere Christianity. And, and the biggest takeaway was that none of them used uh, vivid illustrations the way Lewis did. Right, right. So you're here for the next four days. Yeah. I, I'm sorry we're not going to be able to fit any golf into this trip. <laughs> uh, I don't think the weather's going to cooperate. But what, what is next on, on the project list? For FPA. Well, we right now is a very special time for us because for the first time in our history, we have three different productions mm-hmm. in three different cities, uh, all playing simultaneously. So while I'm here in Austin, Texas with C.S. Lewis, The Most Reluctant Convert, doing six performances, right. I mentioned earlier that Screw Tape Letters is in Washington, D.C. for eight sold-out performances there. Wow. And in New York, we have our, our fourth season at uh, the Acorn Theater on Theater Row on 42nd Street. Uh, with uh, Robert Bolt's classic play, A Man for All Seasons, sure. which is doing really, really well. It yeah. runs and it runs there through March third. So if you're, if any of your listeners or uh, viewers are in New York, please come to see A Man for All Seasons, uh, a tremendous story about uh, uh, Sir Thomas More, Chancellor of England, who had to choose between his allegiance to God right. and his duty to King Henry the Eighth of that name. Right. You know, it's which what ultimately ha- led to his death. Right. Which right. is what, and the and the, the premise of the play is what happens. Uh, when fierce political will mm-hmm. collides with deep moral conviction. Right. And the collision makes for an extraordinary piece of theater. Sure. So if I wanted to direct our listeners to FPA's website, what is that address? Well, uh, I would start with uh, cslewisonstage.com. Okay. Yeah, that's a good place to start. Great. And then take you to all the other places. Well, Max McLean, thank you for coming on the Trey Blocker Show. It's our tradition to end each episode with some words of wisdom from our special guests. Sometimes that's a quote from a famous person, a Bible yeah. verse, or just something that happens to be on your mind. So do you have anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, you know, the, the, the life verse that, uh, that resonates with me almost every day is Ephesians 2.10. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's something good for us all to keep in mind. Thank you. Max, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you all for listening to the Trey Blocker Show. You can find us at treyblockershow.com on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Thanks and God bless. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit treyblockershow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.